gospel lesson comes from Luke 8, beginning with the 22nd verse. Um, all of the synoptics, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, um, which tell pretty much the same story about Jesus, Matthew and Luke following the sequence of Mark, often quoting from him extensively. They are very much interrelated. All tell the story uh, with varying levels of detail. Um, the story, uh, as each one tells it, remains the same. Jesus has been ministering with his disciples on one side of the lake and decides he needs to go to the other side of the lake. And as is often the case, uh, an unexpected storm comes up, much like it would on, on Lake Erie. Uh, and just like on Lake Erie, the lake is so shallow that um, the waves get pretty extreme, so it is on the Sea of Galilee. Um, there are a couple things to listen for here. Uh, one is, what is the word that Jesus uses to calm the sea? I want you to listen up for what verb is used. And then at the end, what is the uh, question that the disciples ask? Listen for the word of God. One day he got into a boat with his disciples and he said to them, let us go across to the other side of the lake. So they put out. And while they were sailing, he fell asleep. A windstorm swept down on the lake and the boat was filling with water and they were in danger. They went to him and woke him up, shouting, Master, Master, we are perished. And he woke up and rebuked the wind and the raging waves. They ceased, and there was a calm. He said to them, Where is your faith? <clears throat> they were afraid and amazed and said to one another, Who then is this? that he commands even the winds and the water, and they obey him. All kinds of stories, either in the middle of it, or anticipating it, or cleaning up afterwards. Um, one of my favorite, not favorite, uh, one of my most vivid memories is going camping with my young family when Laura and Brian were perhaps uh, six and seven years old, and we decided that we would tent on the Outer Banks. Now, the Outer Banks doesn't have very many trees on it, especially on the ocean side. Guess where we were camping? On the ocean side, and in the middle of the night, the storm came up, and it was not very gentle. It was not a gentle rain the way we just experienced here in the sanctuary. Uh, the winds came up and I had this huge 9 by 18 canvas tent that fortunately had exterior aluminum framing to it. Okay? Um, on the other hand, it long ago had started to leak around the seams at the top. My father had purchased this tent in the early 60s from Sears, and it had been through lots of family camping there. We're now in the, like, 1980, you know, so I had this blue plastic, paper plastic tarp, you know, that I had uh, bungee corded, you know. So when the winds came up, it wasn't a nice flapping, it was, you know, all this going on. Well, there we are, exposed on the beach, you know, on the dunes above the beach, in the lightning storms. And there is nothing to buffer the sound of the lightning. You know, there by the ocean, the, the sound just rolls and rolls. And uh, the lightning felt like it was, you know, within a mile. You know, you do the lightning flashes and then you count. It was flash. Um, and, you know, in those cases, you're supposed to be the adult, you know? You, you want to pull the sleeping bag up over and pray that it goes away, and the kids are crying, and the wife is nervous, and you have to be the adult. No, no, they're aluminum, they're aluminum, they're aluminum, you know? We're the tallest thing on the beach, you know? Um, 
Uh, so finally, it goes goes blind. Oh, but a boy that is etched in my mind, etched in my mind. Now, around here, I'll bet you know, like one of our kids put down a blizzard. You ever been caught driving out in a blizzard, or have you ever been hiking, you know, and suddenly had a storm come up, uh, or, or suddenly you're, you're wading through snow? Uh, all of it, very disconcerting. What were some of the things that you put down quickly? What are some of the other events? <laughs> An earthquake in California? Wow. Tornado. A tornado. Who's been in a tornado? Okay, a couple of you have been in tornadoes. <laughs> Somebody else? What did you, what, what did you put down? Anybody else? What's that? Hurricane. Hurricane. <clears throat> Well, of course, you know, all the people that have to say, you understand? Yeah. Now, what is it here? On the one hand, if you have a vantage point and a thunderstorm is coming up, isn't that something to see? Uh, I, I once lived in a house in Pennsylvania where our home looked out on the mountains and we had a good view of the western sky. And there were times, I remember one time in particular, the weather system was coming in, and it was a clear sky to the east, and it was whirling, gray, dark clouds coming in from the west. You know, that, that's when you want to sing, uh, How Great Thou Art. You know? Oh, rolling thunder. You know, it's so beautiful and majestic, right? But then you're in it. And suddenly you go from having this sense of grace Oh my goodness, how, how, how awesome that I can see that, that power displayed. And then it's all about me. And then it's like, oh, uh, and, and we have this kind of poetry in, in our faith material where we're seeing uh, God's angry voice. We're seeing God's wrath and the thunder and the lightning and the, and the, and the extreme of, of the weather. Um, uh, who, somebody, um, oh, Mike was talking about um, uh, being in the San Ana winds in California. Sustained 100 mile an hour winds in Los Angeles. And, and watching that happen, it would, it would feel the pain off the houses. And, and those are, I mean, you just feel so small and powerless and fearful, right? So we have, we have both of those, those kinds of uh, experiences when it comes to sin <coughs> um, And certainly, that's what the disciples had to be feeling in the back of the boat. Now, it's one thing to be on solid ground when there's a storm. I don't want to be in a boat. You know? Uh, the, the, the pictures that you see in movies of the, of the great battleships, you know, that they see in the waves going, hmm, I, I don't want to be in the Navy. You know? A solid ground for me. Um, but they're in these small boats. They're about in a boat that long and not much wider than the eye. And I hope they have, do they have 12, 13 men in that boat? Oh my gosh. Okay. And the wind, is it's a windstorm that comes down and starts whipping up the waves and they go over the guns. And you're going to sink. And what recourse do you have? Okay. On the one hand, they might have thought, "Oh, look at the look at the clouds. Isn't that beautiful?" Right. And then and then the danger comes. And now it's in, in Mark. They actually wake Jesus up by saying, "Don't you care about us?" And so they wake him up. That's why he says, "Don't you have any faith?" But how often have you thought? This storm is now not about, oh, Northeast from Ohio is getting the weather from moving through. This is about me. God is inconveniencing me with this blizzard on 271. You know? now, this storm is threatening me and my family in my old canvas tent. God, stop it. Right? 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 And it ends up being, we personalize it. 
This is about me. Um, and of course, the Bible, if you will, spiritualizes storms. There's not only the storms that we see outside of us in our weather reports, but there are the storms within, the inner conflicts, the wars that we have going on within our own selves, <clears throat> conflicting emotions and ambitions, the guilt that we feel about things that we regret, the pains that we feel of things that have been done to us, the, the temptation for revenge, um, but do I have to make a list? And uh, sometimes those, those things just, you know, can break us. Uh, we get depressed. We, we fly off the handle because of the storms going on inside. Well, we're talking about creation um, during this month. And you and I have, uh, we've got some spleen in there. Um, there is little doubt, little, just a shred of doubt left, that the weather that you and I see is being influenced by climactic change around the globe. That uh, things that we are contributing to and have been contributing to for about 150 years with our burning of fossil fuels is having a profound impact climate change. I notice I'm not saying global warming, although that's, that's part of it. Global climate change is happening. And we can argue about to what degree is it human caused or natural caused, but you know, the more I study it and look at it, the more, you know, we've at least got to acknowledge that a large portion of it has to do with us. Well, what's happening? Well, I'm, excuse me, I am no science teacher. I'm an amateur naturalist. So I'm going to give this a shot, okay? Just to remind us of how the mechanism works here. Our climate and weather starts with the sun. And when the sun shines down on our earth, you know, no matter whether it's tilted one way or the other, the sun's rays come down and <coughs> hit the earth pretty much unimpeded. Uh, there might be cloud cover for a while, but and I, I love my earth balls because they depict cloud cover. Uh, those clouds are nearly always moving one way or the other. And uh, so the, the sun's rays come down uh, pretty much freely. But they don't get out freely. And the earth is, uh, by one way or the other, returning the warmth uh, back towards space. But um, any sun that hits the Arctic all of that energy gets reflected back. And when, or Antarctica, when the uh, Arctic is frozen over as it is supposed to be most of the year, it all gets reflected back. Um, but around the rest of the Earth, there are other things going on. And what happens is there are two things in our atmosphere that tend to keep heat within the lower level of our atmosphere. One is water vapor. H2O, and the other is carbon dioxide, CO2. Um, and as those things fluctuate, our, our weather fluctuates a little bit. Um, you know, you highs and low pressures have to do with the variations in, in temperature and water vapor and so forth. And um, all of that is what drives our weather. Well, over the last 150 years, we have seen uh, signs in which uh, we are looking at an unprecedented pace of warming of the lower atmosphere. And it uh, almost certainly comes from human caused activity. If we were volcanoes, we'd be in you know, a disastrous time of volcanoes, the, the volume of carbon dioxide and the pollutants going into the atmosphere. But in this 150 years, we haven't had that time of global volcanism. The, um, and there are some, not really equations here, but, but kind of. Um, the higher the temperatures, the more evaporation there is. 
and which means there's more water vapor in the air, which causes more intense rainstorms. Not more frequent, more intense. So you know, this season we haven't had a serious hurricane yet, but if we do have a hurricane this season, the likelihood is it will be more intense than we're used to. Um, you've heard of 500-year floods and so forth. It's not that those kind of floods only happen every 500 years. It's an expression of how probable is it that uh, any particular weather event will uh, have an event that would be a frequent of only 100, 500 years. Um, there have been times in the last 10 years, especially in the Midwest, where we've had two or three 500-year events within a few months of each other. Okay. And um, so that, 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 that's one thing that we have to realize. The other thing is that the higher, for every two degree increase in temperature, there's about a 7% increase in water vapor. <clears throat> in, the last, in this last century, we have seen a 4% increase in temperature. Think of the level of water. Now, if this doesn't make you a little nervous, I've done a very bad job of explaining this. Okay? Now, um, in our story today, we have Jesus using this unique word to bring a calm to the weather. What was the word? Rebuke. That's a little different word to use. It doesn't say, and Jesus calmed the storm. It says he rebuked it. What, what baggage does that word carry? This. It's the same word that Jesus uses when he deals with demons. He rebukes. He's rebuking the spirit of the storm. Now, we have to be careful theologically. Even though... God is understood to, I mean, we've interpreted the thunder to be God's voice or the wrath of God. Uh, more generally in the Bible, we don't have a storm God. Other ancient religions did it, the Babylonians did it, the Egyptians did it, um, the Assyrians did it. They had specific gods that were storm gods. We, we have a God that um, generally is not contained within creation but uh, dwells within it, but not contained by it, and uh, is over and through it, but not contained and not identified with it. We don't have a storm god. Uh, in the ancient way of thinking, it would be, uh, there might be a spirit or, or a demon, and that seems to be the language <coughs> of what Jesus is using. Um, but there is something else going on within the storm. But here's, here's where I, you know, this, you know work, work with me here. Where, where I am encountering this, you know, storm like they are in Colorado, and I appeal to God, you know, for relief from the storm, God no doubt is wanting to redeem me after the storm, help me recover from the storm. But within the storm, because of what we're looking at ecologically with global climate change, who is the spirit within the storm now? If it is human-caused uh, activities that's intensifying the storm, oh my gosh, it's human beings that are at the center of the storm now. And who is Jesus rebuking? Well, in a manner of speaking, Jesus is rebuking us. We bear a responsibility in the, ten, in the intensity of the disasters befall us. Now, what I'm about to say is my own theological angst. And I just offered you for consideration. Um, I don't think I've ever said this in the sermon before. Uh, it's a scary thought that I live with. Um, as I have looked through the Bible and tried to look at human history <coughs> and so forth, I've uh, tried to sort out 
the nature of God's grace and, and the realized salvation that he might effect within history. And uh, my observation is that God will allow us our sins individually and corporately. You want to go do that? God's warning you not to. Don't do this. But he doesn't stand in your way. Oh my gosh. You want to make a disaster, Israel? Not be faithful to me? I warn you with my prophets. But, you know, you're going to end up, you know, in exile. I warn you. I didn't stand in the way. You're going to go do it? You're going to go do it. Surely, God would have prevented the rise of Nazism, and National Socialism, and the culmination of anti-Semitism. So that six to eight million people would not have been executed in World War II in the manner in which they were. And 20 million people, most of them civilians, die in that war. What a human catastrophe. Where's God? Is God going to prevent it from happening? No, I think God is going to give us as much rope as we think we're going to take. Warning us, don't do this. Don't do this. Don't do this. Within that, we experience grace. Some of us are preserved. Some of us experience the full weight of it. Now that unnerves me. That unnerves me. If there is a power for me individually, I, I need to listen. I need to call up my, my will and, and my spiritual resources to say, okay, God has warned me not to go down this path. This isn't good for me spiritually. It's not morally right. It's not ethical. It's not loving. I shouldn't do that. But the same thing is true for the human race, for the church. You know, we're warned. A disaster may come if we do not heed. And I think that's where we are ecologically. Here's the thing, even if we're able to turn off the spigot right now. Now they, they measure CO2 in the atmosphere by parts per million. I'm sorry, for all these numbers. A healthy place is 350 <coughs> parts per million. We've already seen that 4% increase in temperature. Where will it be a fourth? <clears throat> what will life for our grandchildren and great grandchildren be like? Because what we have put into effect now will last thousands of years. It will take the earth thousands of years to adapt. That's what's scary. Who is Jesus rebuking now? <coughs> I think there's a rebuke to us that our chutzpah of thinking that we can do what we wish without consequence, that we can continue to look at only our own present time convenience, that we can be as wasteful and consumptive as we have been and not have it bear any negative consequences, either for ourselves or for the community. <coughs> that is just foolish thinking. <coughs> foolish thinking. We have an opportunity in this generation to make a difference. To receive the rebuke and answer the question the disciples ask, who is this? Who is this that even the sun or, or that the, the, the wind and the seas obey? Well, it's the cosmic Christ, the Lord of creation. And if they obey, shouldn't we? So a part of our Christian discipleship is to be Make creation itself a neighbor. Love creation as ourselves. To have this broader view, not just about me, it's about all of creation and about the generations to follow us and the kind of earth and life that they might be living based on what we do now. That's why. And there would be a litany for the month. And then, and then I'll go on to something else, I promise. But for us to live as simply as we can, for us to limit consumption, to uh, you know, reduce the carbon imprint, go online, see, see what that's about. And those fundamental things of recycle and reuse.
reuse and uh, recycle, reuse, reduce, reduce. <coughs> All those things fundamental to our, uh, our, our lived out lifestyle are crucial, are crucial for putting a different spirit in the extremes, in the extremes of, of the weather around us. Each one of us has a role to play to that. But here's, here's the place of hope. Profound change has always happened when communities organize and share common values around a common end. I think the church is a perfect platform in this. And our faith is what we're doing season of creation. Our faith offers resources of perspective and engagement and understanding that can lead us to make a difference altogether. Richfield UCC can be one of those congregations that is a green congregation. Why not? Well, what a better place to be postured, you know, next to the National Park and, and, and just, just the Richfield area. Oh my gosh, how beautiful it is. And this congregation could bear, have a great deal of leverage around having other people, other people understand how important all this is and how it's a matter Acknowledging 